welcome everyone to the third webinar in our Early Learning Network Spring webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Lisa Kenoki, and I'm the co-principal investigator for the Early Learning Network lead at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. This is a four-part series offered bi-weekly to bring you experts from across the country to share some of the research findings from the Early Learning Network and to highlight some policies and practices that will help children maintain early learning success during the critical period from pre-kindergarten or pre-K to grade three. Today, we have an opportunity to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in early learning. So this is an important theme across the network's nationwide studies. Our presenters today will share insights and information to help us understand how systemic and instructional factors affect equitable early learning experiences and outcomes for children of color and offer some recommendations to practitioners to promote inclusive educational experiences for children and families in early learning settings. So before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. This webinar is being recorded and is going to be streamed live on our Early Learning Network Facebook page. Uh, we will be offering a video of today's presentation along with the slides uh, that are shared today and other resources on our Early Learning, ne Early Learning Network website by next week. We have one more webinar in our spring series. You can find details about that at earlylearningnetwork.unl.edu. And because there are so many of you on the call, which we're very excited about today, we did have to mute you to manage the session, uh, but your questions, your insights, um, and your input are very important to us. So throughout the presentation and during the formal Q&A period we'll have that follows, we do invite you to submit your questions to us using the Q&A button that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So, and we will do, try our best to answer the questions that you have by the end of the webinar. And so using the Q&A feature versus the chat feature for your questions allows our team to manage the questions that are coming in, um, organizing, organize them more efficiently. Sometimes questions can get lost in the chat. If you're joining us on Facebook today, you may submit your questions in the comment section of the Facebook Live video, and we'll be tracking those there. Please use the chat box to engage in dialogue throughout the webinar. Um, however, that, that's available to everyone to see that your comments or insights, so we encourage you to share your thoughts and observations there. So right now, I invite you to tell us a bit about yourself your name, where you're located, your role in early childhood education. We really are thrilled to have participation from across the nation and from professionals across a variety of sectors. So please let us and the rest of the group know who you are and where you are. We have folks on the call from Oregon, California, Maryland, Colorado, Arizona, Oklahoma, Hawaii, New York, many states. Um, just to name a few, our participant group today includes teachers, directors, TA specialists, paraprofessionals, policy analysts, coaches, program managers, the list just goes on. So thank you all for joining us today. We're really um, excited to have you here and share and, and hear the information we have to share. So lastly, you can access closed caption by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you'd like access to that. So in a minute, I'll turn things over to today's co-presenters. First, I wanna give you a brief overview uh, of the Early Learning Network and its mission. So the Nationwide Early Learning Network was established in 2016 and is funded by the Institute of Education Sciences at the US Department of Education. The mission of our network is to advance collectively our understanding of policies and practices that will narrow the achievement gap and maintain early learning success as children transition from pre-K to elementary school and beyond. The network consists of five research teams, one assessment team, 
and a network lead team. And those are located on, on the map here. You can see where we are. Um, our research teams are studying children's transitions from pre-K through third grade in communities across multiple regions of the country, uh, ranging from a variety of geographic settings. We have um, rural settings represented, urban settings represented, and we certainly have children and families um, representing various racial, ethnic, and linguistic backgrounds um, as part of our study group. So the map shows where the five research teams and the assessment team are located. The University of Virginia is conducting their work in Fairfax County, which is a diverse county in Northern Virginia. MDRC and the University of Michigan are conducting a study in Boston Public Schools. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hills uh, sample is represents rural North Carolina. Uh, the Ohio State University study is gathering data across the state of Ohio. And our team at the University of Nebraska Lincoln is conducting studies in rural and urban um, Nebraska schools. The assessment team is located at the University of California, Irvine, and they are developing and piloting a new technology based classroom observation system known as OLOS. And this is featured in our next webinar. So we hope you'll, you'll join us for that. So as you know, today's conversation is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion in early learning. Early care and education programs are often pointed to as levers for addressing racial disparities in early learning. However, research consistently shows significant inequities in access to experiences and in outcomes from these programs. So today we're gonna to hear what the network is learning about systemic factors that affect equitable early learning experiences and outcomes for children of color. We'll also learn about the types of instructional practices that support racial equity in early care and education. We're very excited to welcome two researchers from the Early Learning Network who will share research insights um, on studies that they've conducted and offer recommendations in their joint presentation, Building Toward Racial Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Early Learning. So as a reminder on, on submitting your questions, please use the Q&A button that's located at the bottom of the screen rather than chat to post your questions. So this will allow us to track those questions better. Uh, but please use the chat feature for more interactive dialogue, reflections, um, and thoughts to share with the group throughout the webinar. So I'm really pleased now to have a chance to introduce to you Drs. Ioma Ruka and Megan McCormick who each bring a wealth of research expertise and experiences in young children's learning and development. Dr. Yuma Ruka is a research professor of public policy and a founding director of the Equity Research Action Coalition at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And Dr. Megan McCormick is a research associate in family well-being and children's development at MDRC a nonprofit social and educational policy research organization, primarily based in New York City. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Ioma to begin the joint presentation. Thank you, Elisa. Um, hello, everybody in Zoom webinar land. I am Ioma Iruka, she, her, hers, and Good day, good morning. I am in the East Coast, so you know it's lunchtime, um, which means that some little people may come asking for food. Um, but I'm so happy to be here with you all um, as well. So I will share my screen, but I do want to say that um, that I'm really focusing this particular sort of short talk really on the work within the Early Learning Network, the Nebraska site, and I also sort of want to. Um, just make note that there's a lot I could pack into this, but I really want to make sure that we have enough time for really uh, sharing together. And also to not confuse you more, that is true. I am at the University of North Carolina, I am at Chapel Hill, but I am part of the Nebraska team, so not part of the UNC team. Um, it's all confusing. You can uh, tweet me later. 
but either way, just glad to have you all here and really know that we really appreciate, especially for all of our educators, our school leaders um, from the early education sector all the way through the, the K to 12 sector, really just want to thank you all for all that you all are doing for children, families, and, and obviously staff as we sort of are still in the midst of the global pandemic. So, you know, the title of my talk really is around sort of the idea of the achievement gap and really to sort of have us not be so mired in the achievement gap. And it probably is gonna be even more with all the conversations around learning loss. And so I would just say, be careful of using le learning loss as your language, and we can talk about that more. But I really wanted to sort of center just talk on how do we move beyond just gap gazing and really figure out what are the things that really matter, um, really to address what we see as sort of racial disparities and outcomes. So just in case your, um, your internet goes out, you have a coworker of a certain age who needs you or something happens, you know, I want you to sort of know in essence, what am I gonna say to you in, in the few minutes that, that at least I will be speaking directly to you. Um, one is that, you know, in the essence, some gaps still remain, right? Even after we account for things like income, parental education, attending pre-K and so on, right? So the idea that all the gaps is really attributed to economics is one that is not grounded in full science. We know that the gaps, racial gaps still exist even after accounting for a lot of other family, familial and economic factors. But we also know from this work that I'm going to share with you that more supports are needed to really strengthen the homeschool connection, in particular to reduce the black-white gaps, but even other gaps. And this is even more relevant as we are still dealing with a global pandemic, right? How much that really, really matters. Um, and then of course, the need for more culturally relevant and meaningful factors that also explain the Latino white gaps, right? Around things that really matters for, for the Latino community that we have not fully uh, figured out in our research, whether it's familismo, or respeto, right? So there are certain things that are really uh, culturally grounded that we have not fully represented. And so what can we do more about, what can we do about that? And then of course, we need to continue to examine the existence of gaps beyond kindergarten and whether there are other things that we need to still consider, right, over time. And then finally, hopefully I'll leave you with a, the, what I call the four E's. Again, based on a lot of the research I've done around homeschool partnerships, family school relationships, really about how do we center four E's uh, to move beyond the gap gaze and really try to engage in transformative homeschool partnerships. So to just sort of just briefly start with the rationale of like sort of the, the study that I'm talking through, right, is that we know like the achievement gap is one of the most pernicious social challenges we have really like I came into graduate school I you know I'm a researcher because primarily of what we call the achievement gap again I want us to be careful with that language because it sort of uh, says that it's the children's fault right as opposed to this larger systemic issues around opportunities around historical racism right so so we need to make sure that we're not positioning children as a problem but rather the, the, the systems and the conditions that place these children at risk of the achievement gap. But it's really important to uncover what are the things that are going to reduce or eliminate these gaps as we call malleable factors, right? We know that children develop in many systems that influence their learning and life outcomes. And they actually may be different across racial groups. So for example, a child who grows up in a, in a rural community that's predominantly black may be different than a child who grows up in a predominantly black you know, community in, a, in an urban setting, right? Or even you know, family in terms of where your family lives, your family's living condition, and in even the larger the state that you're from, like here our state is in Nebraska, right? So we know there's many systems that impact children directly and indirectly from before they're born, throughout the entire life course, right? So really begin to understand the complexity of that, right? But right now I'm gonna really center in on the classroom and the school, but recognize that schools are also impacted by society, they're impacted by policy, they're impacted by a global pandemic, right? So begin to recognize that there's a lot of things that's outside of the control of schools, but trying to also figure out what is possible within the school uh, 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 role. And also the fact that we know that affirm affirmative and enriching home and classroom environments and their connections have the potential to reduce achievement gaps. We already know that the home environment matters. We also know from my evidence that the classroom environment matters, right? The things around responsive, you know, parent and responsive teaching. We also know homes that are enriching and classrooms are also enriching and that really supports the individual and unique assets and needs of children are important, right? So these are things that we know 
could potentially reduce the achievement gaps. And so now the question is, can we actually empirically test that uh, in, in many ways? So without boring you with all of the analysis that we did, I sort of want to kind of give you the take home. So mind you, we did a lot of analyses with our data of over 200 plus children um, in Nebraska. And, you know, and so we, so we have all these analyses and without boring, I kind of want to kind of take you right to what did we find? We looked, we basically our question is to what extent do these other factors of classroom, of home, and then also accounting for income, education, pre-K attendance, I have to take into account what gaps remain and how and what matters the most for children and what matters for addressing the gap, which is really one of the most important questions really of, of the country, right? So here's what we found. One is that black, white, and Latino white gaps existed at the end of kindergarten in language, reading, math and problem behavior. And so I should just make clear that language and reading and math were directly assessed, right? So that means that we actually use standardized assessments to do that. Similarly, problem behavior was also uh, uh, direct, was also a standardized assessment, but really through teacher ratings. And so at the end of kindergarten, we still had these gaps between racial groups, right? This is not surprising, this is not shocking, right? Because in the end of it, pre-K and other experiences cannot close all the gaps that exist, right? And then we also found that there were black white gaps in home practices and parent teacher conferences and home practices just means how much families were engaged and how much parents and teachers actually uh, connected with each other discussed children issues or, or supports needed um, and how connected they were between the parents and the teachers and we did discover that really it favored white children in comparison to black children right that that black and that in terms of the practices that white parents reported engaging in more connections and teachers reported engaging in more conference and connections with um, white uh, families. So again, we do see those gaps. And similarly, we do see a similar gap between the Latine and whites in terms of the homeschool conference. And again, this indication that there is a gap, racial gap, at least between homeschool conference and in conversation. So again, it means that not only do we have disparities or differences in terms of the outcomes of interest, which is language, reading, math, and prompt behavior, but also in those predictors, particularly around the homeschool connections and in the practices as well across racial groups. So that means that we have two areas of disparities that we have to attend to. But when we really got, went deeper and really say, okay, what really matters? After we take into account the differences in terms of the outcomes, the differences in terms of the factors, differences in terms of uh, economics, family education, et cetera, what emerged is are the following. One is that homeschool connections reduce the black white gaps in problem behaviors, right? So that means that the teachers who are likely to rate black children having, as having more problem behaviors were actually less likely to do that when there was a stronger communication and relationships between homes and schools. And that really makes sense to you, right? When you can actually engage with families, when you can understand the, the sort of either the condition or, or see a child uniquely as a unique person, right? Who may have different ways of being, different ways of learning, um, that you may actually view their behavior in a different way. So, and that's, so this is another evidence that above and beyond income, education, pre-K attendance that this homeschool connection really reduced that gap. Again, an area of potential intervention, right? But unfortunately, there was no known factor, at least that we collected or that we analyzed that reduced the Latina white or the black white gap in language. And this is an expressive language specifically, right? So the language of communication, um, sort of children's vocabulary language, those sort of things that from our measure of pre-K attendance, our socioeconomic status variables, um, even the homeschool connection variables, even classroom environment quality, none of these things actually reduce the gaps that we saw in, in, in those racial um, disparity outcomes at the end of kindergarten, which means that we have to do a bit more digging when it comes to language. When it comes to sort of behaviors that teachers have to rate, we can see that homeschool matters, right? When it comes to things like language and some of these other sort of what I think uh, Omega would talk about in a little bit, um, that some of these things requires probably more than just homeschool connection, but we require us to dig deep about what really builds children's language, especially expressive and communicative language. So with all this in mind, right, again, knowing that homeschool connection matters, but not for every single thing, and knowing that income matters, education matters, but again, we still have these gaps, 
what does that leave us? Like, what does it mean? Like, okay, we do nothing? Of course not, right? So I would say when we think about all the science that we know to date about what I think in many ways is instrumental and, and particularly relevant for Black children, Latina children, and potentially other children of color, we still know that homeschool connections and those relationships really matter. And so I'll leave you sort of with what I call the four E's, right? Um, and, and it's really around the idea of culture responsive anti-bias uh, framework of family engagement, which, which really means that if we're trying to really create a much more affirming, responsive, connected homeschool partnership, there's a few things that we actually have to do and the science sort of says that this is, these are important things. One is of this idea of exploration, that we have to actually engage in understanding families' goals, families' experiences, families' needs, especially in relation to their child and all their children. So being able to explore what funds of knowledge children have, what funds of knowledge families bring, right? Because at the end of it, not all of us are sort of engaged in sort of the white Eurocentric middle class ways of being. And so being able to explore in a very unique and authentic way is really one way of ensuring that you are meeting the needs of each child uh, in your classroom, in your program, and in your school. The second one is around expectations. So one of the biggest indicators, one of the biggest predictor actually of child outcomes is actually parent expectations, which means that when parents have high expectations, children meet it. So similarly, when teachers have high expectations, children need it. So in the same vein of family engagement and homeschool partnership, when you have high expectation that families are really deeply engaged with their children in the most meaningful way, then you're going to create the condition for them to be engaged. It doesn't mean that they're going to meet it in the way that you expect, like come to parent-teacher conference at four o'clock or do this homework. It, it, but it's, it's having expectations that parents are going to do their best and engage with you in, in the way that that's really authentic. And when you have those expectations, you then as an educator or as a school leader, create the space, the opportunities for parents to really engage in a much more transformative relationship that then meets the needs of the child. And then the third E is really around education. And I don't mean formal education. I really mean around the education of informing families about what is early care education? What is pre-K versus preschool? What is this whole transformative, you know, trans, uh, transition kindergarten? Or what is, you know, an IEP, an IFSP? What, you know, what are all these acronyms and alphabet soup names? Or what is that family should do in order to sort of make sure that children are ready for school? Or what schools can be, do to be ready for, for children and families? And so it's really educating families about the way the education system works in your local communities, in your states, what are assessments? that are used. So again, it's really providing that education for those who may not be fully seated in, in, in sort of this idea of the education institution. And all that in the end of it is to empower. And I, I don't use that word anymore. I should use the word equipment because empower is really a pejorative term, right? So in, in essence, I should have changed this now to really be about equipment. So if we're able to, to engage in sort of the four E's, we are actually equipping families to really engage with educators in schools to meet the needs of children, right? The education of children is not only a school business, it's a family business. And so we can really explore with families, have high expectations, educate and provide necessary information, then we are fully equipping families to say, no matter whether your child is in my school, in my program, that they know how to now sort of engage with the education community or even the health community or other community or other organizations or institutions to better meet their needs. And so really that's what I would say is that the four E's is kind of a way to say, how can you do much more authentic engagement? And especially when we're thinking about anti-bias and anti-racist work is that you have to actually do more than just the basic of just, you know, whether it's newsletters or parent-teacher conference, but you actually have to engage in this back and forth dialogue and interaction and connection, especially with families who have historically not really been part of the educational fabric framework. So again, just to remind us, the take-home points that I have is that the gaps still remain. It's not an economic-only issue. It's not a pre-K-only issue. And so we have to continue to find out what really matters. And of course, we have to continue to figure out how do we strengthen the homeschool connection, particularly between communities of color, and I say specifically Latino communities, Black communities, and even our tribal communities, and, and sort of an education system that historically has really been centered on, on whiteness and what matters for white and middle class families. And of course, for our research community, we have to begin to unpack what are culturally relevant and meaningful things, not just for Latino people, but also for Black people, for Indigenous people, and other people of color, other children of families of 
color. But we have to begin to kind of dig deeper, even in our own research reservoir. And then finally, we need to sort of think beyond kindergarten and examine other things that may matter over time. And then, of course, I'll just again remind us that when you can center the four E's of exploration, of education, of expectation, and then also equipment, then you are really in sort of moving towards a really strong homeschool partnership. So with that, I say thank you. And then obviously, uh, I pass it on to, to Megan and hopefully more conversation. Always intimidating for me to present after Yoma, um, but hopefully I'll try not to be, try to build on the expertise and wisdom from those, those critical findings that she shared and kind of build some additional evidence from some partnership work that my team um, in the Early Learning Network, MBRC, is doing with the Boston Public Schools Department of Early Childhood, um, folks from the University of Michigan, and um, folks from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, yeah, as I noted, we, we really do think of ourselves as a research practice partnership in this project um, because Jason Sachs, who's the um, executive director of the Department of Early Childhood for the Boston Public Schools, is a co-PI on our study. And the goal is to really leverage the data so that we can directly inform the decisions that the district is making about how to allocate professional development, how to think about implementation of curricula, and how to strengthen the early childhood experiences for kids in the future. This year has been very interesting in working on that because um, most of the school in Boston has been remote this year. The kids are back in person now and they'll be returning in the fall. They haven't announced it yet, but um, we're anticipating it would be in, in person in the fall. Um, so the, the hope is that the findings from this work are really gonna be driving some decisions this summer. So yeah, my co-authors in this work are the um, PI for the MBRC study, Joanne Shue, um, co-PI, Christina Weiland, um, the University of Michigan, and Kathleen Snow as well, Harvard Graduate School of Education. Our work is really focused on not just doing more research to identify opportunity gaps, but really to understand what are the critical practices that are happening in early childhood education contexts that are ameliorating those gaps on promoting more equity for Black and Latino children. So as you can see here, we have a wealth of research from many, many studies looking at comparisons of children's uh, scores on different types of assessments done at the beginning of kindergarten, that there is a substantial opportunity gap at the beginning of kindergarten, differentiating um, the you know, scores um, on these assessments between black and white students and white Hispanic students, as well as students from higher income families compared to families with lower incomes. And here I've just kind of given you um, a box around what this looks like when we look at national data. So on average, if we look at the scores between white students and um, black students, it, it's about a fifth of the standard deviation um, and it's even larger for um, Hispanic students. Interestingly, though, we've actually seen um, those opportunity gaps close a little over the past 10 years. So this work from Sean Reardon is kind of showing um, differences in what these trajectories look like for students who are part of the, um, an earlier cohort of students who participated in the early childhood longitudinal study kindergarten cohort um, in the 1998 cohort compared to the 2010 cohort. But those gaps actually haven't necessarily grown for um, they have it closed for Hispanic and white students. And it looks very similar for language and literacy skills. We're seeing kind of like similar trends. But what's really interesting is we don't see the gaps um, grow a lot during the school year. We see that kids are coming in with an opportunity gap. So something's happening in early childhood experiences, um, kind of structural and systemic drivers likely a combination of structural and systemic drivers um, affecting that opportunity gap. But we don't see that once kids are in kindergarten, it's not like schools are necessarily contributing to further growth in that. Um, so it really does, these data kind of suggest, and I share them because it looks like there's, there is an opportunity to invest in early childhood education contexts in order to think about racial equity. Um, 
And enrollment in high quality pre-K has been identified as one key strategy for kind of reducing those opportunity gaps prior to kindergarten entry. There's a host of different researchers who have kind of honed in on these data, not just in the United States, but other countries as well, identifying high quality early care and education as being a policy that um, the federal government, states, local governments can invest in not only to support the well-being of children in general, but actually with the targeted goal of promoting equitable outcomes for students. Um, and we do know that some pre-K studies have shown that um, certain students do benefit more from pre-K programming than other students. Um, so for example, if you look at data from the Head Start Impact Study, where they evaluated the impacts of Head Start on children's outcomes, the researchers found that the benefits of Head Start were larger for students who spoke English as a second language. Um, so students who were dual language learners, students from Hispanic families, and students who started Head Start um, scoring lower on assessments of language and math skills. But then there's, there's other data showing that we actually don't see differential benefits by family income and race. Um, other studies are showing that students benefit in general in the same way. And so that's, that's maybe equality, but that's not equity because it's not supporting students who are being disadvantaged from a broader set of structural and systemic um, in, you know, injustices and inequities. It's not supporting their development in a way that promotes equitable outcomes. And so more work is really needed to understand the key factors in early childhood educational contexts that not only benefit students in general, but actually stand to promote racial equity. So what are the targeted set of practices that um, promote more equitable outcomes for black and white students or white students, uh, Hispanic students compared to white students? We're gonna study this question um, in the Boston Public Schools, which is a unique, a unique context for, for studying this issue. Um, Boston, if you think about the historical and sociocultural context, um, needed when you use an equity lens to do a research study, it is a place with a, a big history of inequity and racial inequity. Um, so there are redlining policies in place up until the 80s and even more informal policies going on today that limit where families can live, they limit families' um, ability to access economic capital and promote families' economic well-being, and have also affected the extent to which students are able to access high quality early care and education. Um, at the same time, the city is very diverse in that all different types of families are engaging and enrolling in the public pre-K program in Boston. So um, you're seeing the most advantaged families, um, white families are choosing the public pre-K program, as well as um, families from um, families with lower incomes, and a broad range of families from different racial ethnic backgrounds. And that is important because it allows us to actually compare how students from different groups are doing. And sometimes in our early care and education research, if we don't have those uh, you know, different types of students enrolled in programs, we can't make those cross-group comparisons. The Boston Pre-K program, as many of you may know, is kind of nationally known as being a high quality pre-kindergarten model. Um, it pairs two evidence-based curricula, one focused on language and literacy, one focused on math, um, with supports for teachers through coaching and training. And in a host of studies um, of varying rigor, the program has been found to have a significant boost on kids' language, literacy, math, and executive functioning skills um, in the short and in the longer term. In our study as well, we're um, able to leverage 10 additional community-based organizations that were implementing the Boston Public Schools pre-kindergarten model. And this is important because, so they were basically implementing the same model as the public schools, but in a community-based setting, like um, in a Head Start context or paired with like Boys and Girls Club. And this is important because of the structures that are available in community-based organizations, like they have wraparound care, they have care during non-traditional pre-K hours, um, and they also um, have services for younger students, so for siblings. Those contexts we know um, are more likely to serve Black and Hispanic students than the public pre-K program. And so we're able to include some of those programs as well. So what we do in the study is, 
we first describe, so this is very similar to what um, other studies have done. We want to examine what is the extent of the opportunity gap in language and math skills, um, differentiating uh, outcomes for white students, black students, and Hispanic students across pre-K and kindergarten. Then we actually want to say, okay, what are the classroom equity factors that can really promote more equity in kids' learning? We think from the literature that things that teachers can do that may promote equity are to ensure that students um, from uh, historically marginalized, marginalized backgrounds are exposed to advanced content, similar to what Ioma was talking about, challenging content. Um, we want to ensure that they're exposed to emotionally supportive contexts, organized contexts. Um, and settings where they're not just being delivered, you know, content isn't just being delivered in a very um, lecture-based format, but they're given the opportunity to engage in a conversation with teachers, and they're engaging in conversations with peers, and they're getting exposed to kind of like relevant and rich content in the classroom um, that exposes them not just to the instruction needed to develop skills, but also um, to learn a broader set of knowledge in which um, skills are more likely to be developed and supported in a long-term way. And we also look at time and instructional settings. So this is where we try to understand the extent to which different types of instruction may promote equity. Um, so here I use the words constrained instruction compared to unconstrained instruction, and I'll give you a little kind of snapshot of what that looks like. But we think of constrained instruction as direct instruction on skills that are kind of um, foundational and important, but they are, there's kind of a ceiling on when they can be developed. So teachers may spend a lot of time teaching letter names or letter sounds or numbers one to 20. But once students learn those skills, there's a ceiling on them, they're constrained. You can kind of no longer keep getting better at that skill as opposed to unconstrained instruction, which promotes things like vocabulary knowledge, problem solving, concept development. Um, and those are skills that we can develop throughout the life course. So examples might be students who engage, uh, teachers who engage students in um, read alouds and engage with them in many back and forth and rich conversations. That type of instruction may be considered more unconstrained because it's supporting kids to think about making connections between the text and their real life, developing um, more advanced vocabulary, and thinking about problem solving it within the context of that read aloud, more so than kind of like direct skills instruction related to letter naming. Um, both things are important, but we have a theory that um, there may be an equity gap in how much white students are exposed to unconstrained instruction as opposed to black students. Um, so we know, for example, that there's teacher biases where teachers have lower expectations for black students, which may sometimes manifest itself in more kind of like direct skills instruction on constrained content, rather than exposing those students to this broader set of rich and relevant um, knowledge that they can kind of embed skills teaching within. And I'm ha we're gonna talk, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So our study, we used a random sampling procedure in the Boston Public Schools. Um, of the 76 schools in Boston offering the pre-kindergarten program, we selected 20 public schools and 10 partner community-based organizations to participate. And then we randomly selected teachers and students in those participating schools and CBOs. We got a rich set of data. So we um, assessed all children on similar measures of receptive vocabulary, math skills. Um, I'm not gonna talk about them as much, but we also got teacher reports of kids' social emotional skills and behavioral assessments similar to um, what the Nebraska team did. Then we got rich classroom observations. So we collected something called the class, which I'm sure people are familiar with, um, which assesses emotional support, classroom organization, and instructional support. But we also um, got videos of individual students within the classroom, and we're able to code basically second by second the, their exposure to different types of instruction. And in doing so, we recognize that instruction doesn't look the same for all kids in early childhood classrooms. Um, it actually looks very, sometimes very different depending on who you are and your, your background characteristics, including race, 
um, as well as whether you attended pre-K or not in kindergarten. Um, and so these individual level metrics allowed us to get that level of nuance and um, allowed us to capture variation in kids' experiences, instructional experiences within classrooms. We also asked teachers to report on the extent to which their pra uh, the practices they used um, were more advanced or basic, um, aligned with state standards. We had access to administrative data so we could assess kids' features like kids' race as reported by their parents. Um, and then we also had parent surveys to get an understanding of what um, parents were perceiving their educational experiences were like. So to give you a little snapshot when I'm talking about constrained and unconstrained instruction, I won't go through all of these, but these everyone here is educators, so you'll these will not be um, foreign top concepts to you. These are kind of how we differentiate um, activities in the classroom that would be considered more constrained compared to more unconstrained. Um, both again, both are very important. Um, but what we did find in our study is that teachers spend most of their time, even in Boston, which includes kind of this, these evidence-based curricula that are supposed to be rich and relevant and engaging kids in rich content. Um, we did find that teachers spend most of their time, particularly in math, engaged in constrained instruction. So they do a lot of um, phonological awareness, word decoding, word encoding. They spend a lot of time on kind of like pre-literacy skills. Um, basic print and text concepts, kind of, uh, and then basic early writing skills. And we saw less, fewer examples um, and less frequently um, teachers engaging in oral language, print vocabulary, comparing, contrasting, predicting, inferencing. So those kind of like things, those kind of activities that are harder to kind of define, harder to measure, but they are the type of rich interactions that we think are going to be predictive of uh, longer term outcomes. And then we did something similar for math. Um, so you can see in math, we're thinking of more constrained activities as relating to number sense and concepts, um, basic operations, um, early algebra, thinking about geometry, uh, shape identification. Whereas unconstrained math would be more thinking about how do we analyze data? How do we think about probability? And how do we actually compose shapes or consider concepts of measurement? So what do we see in our data if we actually look at what, how kids of different races are doing on our different assessments of language and math skills? So we find the same picture that, um, you know, historically people have found. And this is happening in Boston. Um, and you can actually see that white students in Boston are this blue line, black students are the green line, and Hispanic students. Um, and we use the word Hispanic in our data because that's what the district uses. So I know um, they'll be happy to talk in the chat about there's different um, ways that people are uh, recommending that we talk about students from um, countries of Spanish speaking, Spanish speaking countries of origin. The, but that is the yellow line. And you can actually see that white students in Boston who tend to be higher income are they are scoring pretty far above the national average on um, this assessment of receptive language. Uh, black students are actually at the national average um, by the spring of K, and they are actually showing greater growth in um, language skills during the kindergarten year than white students. Um, but Hispanic students are doing um, are scoring significantly lower than black students in Boston. Interestingly, for Black and mostly Hispanic students, we do see a dip in the summer. So we have a complementary study where we found that um, opportunity gaps actually grow in the summer, probably because we found in our data that white students and higher income students were able to access higher quality summer learning opportunities in the summer. So their skills kind of like stay flat. Um, they don't like grow a lot. They, they continue to grow in skills in the summer. Um, but they, the gap, the opportunity gap between students of different races grows during the summer. And we did see a not totally dissimilar pattern in math, but everybody actually kind of does worse relative to the national average in math, the white students across time. Um, the, we don't see a huge gap in math skills between black and Hispanic students. Um, but in pre-K, Black and Hispanic students are actually very close to the national average, even though they're scoring significantly lower than white students. Um, but this this is really where we saw our summer summer learning and opportunity gap in summer emerge. And I'd love to talk about our summer findings because it really has implications, particularly for this coming summer, 
I'm thinking about how districts are rolling out summer programming. So our two key findings that I really wanted to share with you today are that we find evidence in our data that when students um, are exposed, when Black and Hispanic students were exposed to more unconstrained language instruction in kindergarten, it actually, um, in, sorry, in pre-K and kindergarten, that was a factor that drove more equitable language outcomes um, for those students. So you actually see, this is the kind of green line, is um, non-white students who um, were exposed to high levels of unconstrained instruction. And you can see that this, this kind of slope of this line is faster than the blue line, which are the students who are similarly, similar in terms of demographics, but were exposed to lower levels of unconstrained language instruction. Um, so again, they were, they spent a lot of time like learning direct skills, whereas the green line students spent a lot of, spent more time engaging in those kind of like rich conversations, those that back and forth, predicting, inferencing, talking about making connections between the story and their real life. Um, and we did see that the kind of opportunity gap, it still exists between white students and non-white students, but it's smaller. And a similar story, but more stark for math where when um, non-white students, which is the um, yellow line here, were exposed to more unconstrained instruction, um, they were, they actually almost catch up with the white students um, who are exposed to less unconstrained instruction. So the, that difference, this initial difference here is much smaller here at the end of kindergarten when those um, students get that opportunity to get that type of instruction. Interestingly, we found that students uh, who were Black and Hispanic tended to get more exposure to more unconstrained instruction when they were actually enrolled in classrooms um, that were less segregated. Um, so in Boston, um, we do have an, an issue, like many, this is obviously a systemic, a systemic issue in education with um, like structural segregation, Schools are very much defined, even though there's school choice for pre-kindergartens, um, most people do choose to attend a school that is in their neighborhood. The city has segregated neighborhoods and the schools tend to have segregated kind of patterns. But sometimes you actually see, due to multiple factors, more integrated schools. So there's more racially integrated schools and that's actually where we did see that black students had the most, um, the highest kind of likelihood of it being exposed to more unconstrained instruction. So what are our kind of recommendations for practice based on this work? So this work is definitely, these are just correlations between students' experiences and their outcomes. Um, we definitely would love to do more experimental research looking at the impacts of curricula that balance constrained and unconstrained instruction for students and looking at how those, those maybe um, support equity. But um, initial thoughts based on this research are that students really should focus, uh, schools really should consider focusing on more time on math and like understanding the extent to which teachers in elementary school, so pre-K and K, are focused on math. We generally find these teachers spend a lot less time on math than on language and literacy. There's probably multiple reasons for that. But if there's a way to embed a strong math curriculum to support exposure to math and unconstrained math in particular, that may be one key ingredient to promoting equity for kids. Um, we also think it's important to choose curricula and um, kind of instructional uh, materials that expose kids to rich and relevant content that allows them to engage in the types of activities that kind of support um, that go kind of beyond learning skills for skills sake. And there's different ways that we can talk about actually making that happen in the classroom. But that actually is really important. We think from our research, not just for kids development in general, but for promoting equity, because black and Hispanic students are less likely to be exposed to that type of instruction. And also engaging students through play. So what we found is un unconstrained instruction is a lot of the time seen in like centers and open-ended play that kids engage in with their peers and teachers. And so also having structures via curricula or other professional development tools to support um, instruction through play, particularly for Black and Hispanic students, may be a key factor for promoting equity. Thank you for listening. Um, 
excited for the, the Q&A, and here is the contact information for other folks um, in, our, in our team if you're interested in reaching out. Thanks, Megan and Ioma for those very thoughtful presentations. I think there's some, certainly some key takeaways here um, for the group around importance of language, um, connections with between home and school, thinking about the types of instruction with unconstrained instruction being something that's, that's powerful. We have had several questions come in, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and pose those to you in the, in the few moments that we have left. I'm gonna start with one that came in for um, Ioma about how do you recommend um, that we address the challenge of time, particularly paid time for teachers to explore family funds of knowledge? How can schools and systems administrators make time um, for, for this important activity? I thank you, Lisa. And I, mean, I think that's a really, really good question in terms of, right, to ask, you know, teachers to sort of engage in, especially say like the four E's, right? This is actually one that has to, I think we have to create the condition, right? Because number one, we know still teachers are still underpaid, undervalued. And so there's still that larger work we have to do in society to provide those opportunities. So I would say that a couple of ways that we've seen where time can be created is one sort of using that before school starts in terms of like the formal school year starts is to maybe begin to reach out to families, especially families who you may not have heard from, who may be new in the community. And so I think it's, it's the schools being more ready, right? A lot of times we're focusing on sort of this kindergarten roundup sort of ideas. And really it's about what could schools do to get ready for the children they have. And part of that actually, you know, is, is many times actually reaching out to families, figure out who they don't know. And of course, you know, people always say go to do home visits. And that also is time intensive. And it doesn't always get you all that you need. So the other way is to activate the other, I think a lot of schools do have social support staff. And so how do you actually maybe actually create much more of this hub of, of sort of where families are sort of supported, right? It may not always be directly with the classroom teacher, but it could be other staff or members of either the community, which mean like the other family members. It could be also other sort of uh, teaching staff or staff in the schools. So there's not just one person that the parents could go to, right? But it could be other people in the school community that also could be that conduit that could also share information back and forth, especially with teachers who have 30 students and 35 students as we've seen in, in a lot of our sort of uh, schools nowadays. And so I do think there's certain things that we can, the structures we can create to make that a little bit easier. The other way also is also, you know, now that we have technology and a lot of families, you know, fortunately or unfortunately use it, right? So we can, I think, use things like Twitter, right, you know, minimally, right, to see what families are thinking about. You can also use text, and we do find that a lot of families, particularly families of color, uh, particularly families who may, English may not be their first language, may feel comfortable being able to use the technology to sort of communicate and not sort of feel ashamed of their language not being the perfect English for the school administrators or educators. So maybe even using some of those tools. But this means actually finding out from families themselves, and that could be through questions or surveys. What is the best way to communicate with you? And who else should we include in this communication um, in many ways? But again, this requires a, a, an intentionality, and that means that we have to build some things in, ahead of time and not sort of do it on the fly. Because I think the issue we have is that teachers are already overwhelmed with their actual sort of in-classroom work, and it's how to create systems to support teachers to really center family engagement. Because we know when we do that, then the work of the classroom becomes easier because now you have done all that legwork and created that infrastructure to do that better. Thank you. One more question I think we have, we have time for it. And, and Megan, I'll direct this to you, but, but open it up to, to either of you about measurement issues. There were several questions that came in around measurement and the tools we're using to assess uh, progress. The, one was a clarification question about the assessment tools that you used. Megan, in your study, but but generally speaking, how, how should we be thinking about and approaching um, measurement of children's progress? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. We started these studies in 2015 when, I, and I think there's just been a lot of important advancements in thinking about using equity-centered approaches to measurement since we went down this path. I think import, one important country, what important kind of feature of measurement, I think, um, with respect to language assessments um, is to use validated measures to be able to assess the, assess indicators of language for 
people who speak different languages. So not just to assume that English is kind of the primary, the primary goal is to learn English and that if we see differences in English, um, English assessment scores, that's an indicator of a huge gap that needs to be addressed when we know that students in their native language may be, you know, they're dual language learners, so they have multiple kind of competencies and skills across different languages and having measures of language in multiple languages that they speak is like a key issue that I think we need to be focused on. It always creates um, challenges for us in terms of like the scope and the resources of what's available and we can do, but that's that's one thought I kind of have. Um, I also think that in many of the measures that we're using, they have been developed with white students um, and they don't necessarily account for differences in different types of kind of math competencies that are um, key to kids understanding. Um, so for example, we have a complimentary paper where we actually are asking parents about the types of at-home learning activities that they're doing with students. And Black families actually report much higher levels of engaging in these kind of unconstrained math activities at home because they do a lot of, they do a lot of cooking together which is like an unconstrained type of activity that we don't see as much in white families. They have a lot of conversations about money. Um, they have conversations about how we're, how to use money, how to allocate. Like, so there's just things that are happening in different types of families that aren't being picked up by our more traditional measures of math um, that are developed for white students. And so I think it's a huge limitation of our work that we are basing a lot of the, the measurement of where we're seeing opportunity gaps um, in, in our study, you know, we're trying to say, okay, what promotes more equity, but we're using measures and outcomes that are rooted in development with white populations. And I'll just briefly add, because I know we're out of time, is I think Megan is correct, right? And this is even more important when we when we hear all the language around learning and loss, right? That that means then that it's sort of this assumption that children's home, or what they've been doing is not good enough and they have to come into a building to become smarter. And so I think it's beginning to sort of capture other ways that children actually know a lot of things. There's multiple intelligences. So I just put in the chat box, or sort of a link of a webinar I did really around culture responsive, anti-bias sort of anti-racist sort of tools and assessments, um, including classroom environment tools that we're trying to push to, to say, we need to expand the tent of what indicates sort of, you know, achievement and learning. Thanks. I think we're just about out of time today. I'll thank our, um, Panelists, thank you, Emma and Megan, for sharing um, your perspectives and research today. We do invite the group to register for our final webinar in this spring webinar series that will be held June 1st. And we'll be highlighting um, the importance of using assessments and observation tools, tools to guide individualized instruction, which really kind of moves right on from the discussion we're having now. So that's being held June 1st. You can um, Register for this at the Early Learning Network website, earlylearningnetwork.unl.edu. A recording of today's webinar reminder will be available, slides, additional resources. There were several questions about some of the tools and resources that were referenced in today's session. Those will be made available to you um, via the website. We do have two previous webinars. If you haven't had an opportunity to attend on family engagement, and transitions and alignment that are also available on the network website. We encourage you to take a look at those. And please follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can find us, Early Learning Network. Um, join our mailing list on the website, and, and we'll keep you apprised of upcoming events and findings from our studies. So that concludes our webinar today. Thank you, presenters. Thank you to everyone who was able to join us. Have a wonderful afternoon.